Hey everyone, it is 6.30 a.m. February 28th, uh, supposedly 2017. The video that I'm making today, um, I, I didn't actually plan on making a video today, but I got everything done that uh, I needed to get done as per my responsibilities to my God and family. So luckily for me, I was able to make this because what I'm going to begin talking about today, and I don't know if this is going to turn into a series of videos or not, but it's really opening up a can of worms. So it's it's real possible that it'll be a number of videos. It's it's a topic that's been gnawing at my brain and at my uh, innermost self because I kind of think that there's a difference between the two. <clears throat> but um, it has to do with worldview, people's worldviews, how different they are, and how do we form a worldview, especially because we know we live in, a, in an age where th there's purposely been so many lies injected into what we are supposed to be using as our uh, basis of constructing our worldviews. And because people are so individual and the events that take place in our lives to help to shape our worldviews are so different worldviews they end up becoming as uh, unique as fingerprints but I found that in general I don't think a lot of people stop to to try to define what their worldview is, to write it out, to see what it looks like, to perhaps then to refine it. Now what's, what's underlying why I'm making this video is that because of all of the disinformation that is so profuse and prolific and it poses as factual history and science geology astronomy uh, religion spiritual beliefs it, it poses as everything finances society it, it, it has uh, all of these lies. They've saturated. They've saturated every f uh, facet of our lives. So as I've said in previous videos, that we have to start taking what we can prove to be so. And uh, moreover, those things that we find that we have accumulated a preponderance of solid evidence to show them to be factual, objective, and true. And unfortunately, we're going to have to do that. I think in this day and age, we are going to have to create our worldviews based largely on circumstantial evidence because everything out there that purports to be objective factual evidence we know are either outright lies or are holding back enough truth to wildly mislead us I went on a search I think yesterday I just did a regular Google search 
on worldviews. What's a worldview? Well, here they have a basic visual diagram of your worldview where it would be made up of uh, sort of layers, <clears throat> with the innermost being values and then beyond that behavior, beyond that culture. If you take a introductory college level ethics class, you'll get similar ideas to, to what this diagram is showing concerning worldviews. What they tend to usually do at college level overtly, and then before that, and even after that, and of course they interject it into our television and news, movies, magazines, and our society at large, is a uh, it's kind of a reinforcement of these ideas that values and morals are subjective. And I think that a lot of this information concerning ethics, morals, and values, and subjectivity, and what they say is lack of objectivity, is all done by way of sophistry to, again, cause us not to be able to objectively think things through and come to a pretty solid worldview that we can anchor on and work from as we continue to to travel through this life. So there's not really uh, I don't have an outline to this because there was almost no way to come up with an outline to it. That's why I said this just could be a can of worms that I don't know how long it will be opened or will last, but I am hoping that uh, the outcome of it, no matter if it's a, a video or 10, is that it'll cause you to think about your worldview why you hold that worldview, what were the factors that contributed to your developing your unique worldview. And if those factors, whatever they may be, can be trusted. And once you've decided these things, perhaps you'll see that it's time to go back reassess and re-examine, perhaps get a new worldview. Now, I'm not going to go on in, in some sort of a, a psycho babble way about how I think people should be developing a worldview or anything. That's, that's not the point. What I'm going to be doing, I'm going to talk to you about the worldviews I have based on, as I said, we have to base this on mostly circumstantial evidence. And you can, as an attorney, make a very, very strong case based solely on circumstantial evidence. And I know this because I spent enough time going back to jail <laughs> to where I had to get very familiar with the process of law uh, trying a case before a court and what an attorney would need to either sway a judge at, say, an argued sentencing or a jury, if it were to be a jury trial. <clears throat> now, there's a lot of pages out there if you type into Google what is a worldview and they'll give you all pretty basic answers. They're mostly all going to be the same. Even the ones that you go to which purport to be Christian sites talking about a worldview and worldview based on the Bible, they're going to, in general, uh, be repeating sort of the same psycho babble about worldviews. Keeping us, I think, keeping us uh, over in the, uh, the kiddie pool, the shallow waters and not allowing us to dive deep 
into certain things and explore certain ideas and concepts and whether or not they have enough merit to perhaps be true. This site right here from the American Scientific Affiliation, it says, what is a worldview? Definition and introduction. A worldview is a theory of the world used for living in the world. That sentence right there, I am entirely okay with. Because the thing is, our worldview is a theory of the world. Who knows the truth of it all? I think, I think really only one does, and perhaps maybe only to do. And the reason I say it like that is because, and this is part of my worldview, my worldview is anchored very strongly onto what I understand about the Holy Bible. The current accepted 66 canonized books that we have as the Bible. We're going to get to that too, well, concerning the canon of Scripture and what we accept. It's going to be part of it. But that's mostly what my worldview is based on. I've had to drop a lot of views I had in the past. And when I say had to, I don't mean that it was really any work. It was a very natural thing that happened. Uh, when the Spirit of God came into my heart, changed the desires of my heart, these views that I once held, they really naturally just dissolved. And instead they were replaced with the truth, the matters and concepts found within what books we have available that are called the Holy Bible. Now, the reason I said one, <clears throat> then maybe two, is because Jesus had said during his earthly ministry um, that there were even things that he did not know, and there were things that he did not have say over or control over, but that the Father did. So that's part of my worldview, is that the Father and his only begotten son, begotten means through a woman, they are different persons. They are not the exact same person, they're different persons. Now, Jesus did entirely the will of the Father, even when it ran seemingly contrary to his own will, like in the Garden of Gethsemane, before he was taken and wrongly tried and, and wrongly murdered. He sacrificed his will to the Father, so you know that he had a will that was distinct from the Father's will. You know that in some ways... He had a, a mind and a will that even he had to conform to the will of the Father. We know that there was information that only the Father had that he did not. Even the book of Revelation, he, it, it states that it is the revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave to him. The two terms that should be synonymous are God and the Father. Three terms, in fact, God, the Father, Yahweh. And then there is the Son, and he has many titles himself. But they're not the same person. When Jesus says, I and the Father are one, this is correct. He conformed his will entirely to the Father's will. He said he spoke only the Father's 
words. He said he did only what he saw the Father do. In that way, yes, they were unified, but are they the same person? No. So, that explains why I said one person, perhaps two. I'm going only by the words that Jesus himself said to come to that conclusion. So, with that being said, I'm going to be very open about this. Yes, most of my worldview is based on what we have as the Bible. Now, beyond that, many of the things that I think are, again, they're based they're based on a lot, and I mean like a mountain, of circumstances. Bits of information here, bits of information there. Thoughts, intuition. <sighs> really just what is logical, what makes sense. There is a good uh, portion of my worldview that that is really just, it's a working model. And um, I think that's going to be most of us, probably for most of our lives. Some of those things we can get very solid. And we can go on those solid bits of information that we know we have seen enough, either concrete or abstract, either objective or circumstantial bits of information that we can say that's solid and I am going to stay on that. I'm not going to be wavering on that. One of those things that I have that's absolutely solid is that God is not a man that he should lie. So I don't believe that anything that we have from God is untrue. I also don't believe that he deceives us <clears throat> in a way that some people think that God acts deceptively or that his only begotten son, Jesus of Nazareth, would act deceptively. I believe what they have said has been preserved and that they speak nothing but the truth. The reason the Son speaks nothing but the truth is because he speaks only the words of the Father. So I do believe that this God described in the Holy Bible, Yud, He, Wav, and He, Yahweh. And some people pronounce it different, but we're talking about this God, the only true God. That he does not lie, he does not tell us untruths. Furthermore, I also believe that it is the glory of God to conceal a matter, and it is the honor of kings to search that matter out. He's not obligated to us to reveal all matters to us. In no way is he obligated to do that. I think that if you would think that some matter or some bit of information, whether revealed or not revealed, is pivotal in our salvation, then you do not understand what salvation is or how God accomplishes that for us individually and corporately in his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. It's not about information. It's not about Gnosticism. He saves with or without that. And it's true that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's quite correct. But I believe that he has given us everything we need to live a good life and a godly life in all faith and hope in Christ Jesus. Now, there's a lot that remains to be seen for those who 
are Christians, those who are the saints of God Almighty and his children by adoption in Christ. There is a lot, I believe. I believe that that is one of the reasons that when Jesus is addressing the Church of Philadelphia in Revelation 3, he says he calls himself he who has uh, the keys of David. He says he opens and no one can close. And he closes and no one can open. And then he says, Behold, I have laid before you an open door. I think, I really do think that for those of us who are the few, who have very little power, that he is going to reveal to us great things in this time to come. Because I am well over 90% sure that right now we are living in or trans, uh, well, or um, I wanted to say transferring to, are <clears throat> making the, I guess we're in that interim time, going from the Sardisian church to the Philadelphian church. And I have such abundant reason to believe that. And I am going to get into that in more detail in later videos. So he says, I lay, I have, I have set before you, not laid before you, but set before you an open door. We have very little power, but he set before us an open door. Those of us in the body of Christ these days, I think more than maybe for even centuries now, in what has been come to be known as common or popular Christendom, we are going to have to rely so much on the Holy Spirit to give us the intuition, the understanding, the wisdom, the knowledge to navigate through this great world and web of deception that the second beast in Revelation 13 has laid out. And it could just get worse. <clears throat> this, this second beast of Revelation 13, I'm fully confident that is the United States of America, but there's been a great deal of argument over what some of the specifics of it mean, like the two horns. Many people have said, well, that's the separation of powers, church and state. Some could say that it's because when uh, the constitutional uh, America was formed in 1776, because there was another American government that was formed years before that, but the constitutional government that we know of today, the representative republic, was formed as a two-power kingdom in that you had the executive and the legislative because the Supreme Court and that bench of justices was something that was not as foundational as Congress and executive legislative and executive, Congress and President. There are some that would say that because it was so populated with mostly Protestant and Catholic, that would be two horns like a lamb. So there's a lot of people that have a lot of different views. There are some that hold to that picture of two horns like a lamb. Uh, that should make us think of the American buffalo which is, they say, described in the Bible as what is called the wild ox or the wild bull. And it does have lamb-like horns. If you compare the horns of a buffalo to a lamb, it does. The only thing is that, uh, in a way, they are, um, they are kind of moving away from staying with a solid uh, prophetic interpretive uh, system 
because horns, like we see in Revelation, or I'm sorry, Daniel 7, uh, Daniel 8, Daniel 11, um, they're always factions uh, in the ram. It's uh, Medo on one side, Persia on the other. In the he-goat, there's the notable horn, which is Alexander the Great. There's the four horns that spring up when that notable horn is broken, which would be Lysimachus, Cassander, Seleucid, Ptolemy. Uh, the ten horns in the fourth beast in Daniel 7 which would represent the ten factions or kingdoms that would come to make up uh, the Roman Empire, uh, which began happening, um, well, right after Rome enjoyed its glory days under the um, Flavian dynasty. And... And there was their civil wars, and then these uh, kingdoms, uh, which were sub-kingdoms, sprang up and replaced certain peoples, oftentimes challenged Rome, but were integrated as Rome, and then eventually, under Papal Rome, really became what was known as the Holy Roman Empire. So we know that horns are subsets of a kingdom. Individual strong factions which when combined make up a kingdom. So we have to be careful not to put too much weight on the two horns like a lamb on that second beast looking like a buffalo other than to say that it's very interesting with uh, the buffalo being probably the most representative animal of the United States because of how prolific the buffalo population was, at least at one time here. So, that's as far as everything I know about Revelation and Daniel and other prophecy. And I do frequently read through the other prophets, the majors and the minor prophets, to see if a lot of prophecies that are oftentimes irresponsibly applied to the latter days or to our own day were not already fulfilled based on the accumulative knowledge I have of these things I have put us in the Philadelphian church era which also puts us quite a bit away from the seven bowls of wrath being poured out and which would <laughs> in the uh, the accumulation of them the seventh bowl of wrath is when that great whore who rides the beast in Revelation 17 and 18 will meet her demise I think we're I think we're a bit far from that and part of that is governed by what I know and believe about our calendar and what year we're in. I, I do believe it's far more likely we are in the, the year 1717 AD as opposed to 2017 AD. I base this on the works of Herbert Illig, Hans Niemetz, and most notably Emmett Scott. And if you aren't familiar with these things, you can listen to my readings of A Guide to a to the Phantom Dark Age in that playlist for a guide to the Phantom Dark Age. I do insert a lot of commentary during that reading because Scott is writing this from really a neutral position. So he doesn't really speak at all concerning who would be able to perpetuate uh, this deception and how that it might work for them and who is currently in control of education, banking, and really every powerful institution that has an effect on our lives and our psychology today. So I do. I, I add a lot of that uh, commentary. But on with...
my worldview and what's what information is is working at shaping it what bits and pieces of odd <laughs> obscure information is knocking around in my head that's that's forcing me to consider certain things to be at least a strong possibility you have to remember um <clears throat> the people who are controlling the flow of information and they are controlling it they they have they have things pretty well on lockdown and that doesn't mean that no truthful information will flow to us um it has been but it's just been trickling and i think it's going to get more and more and more specifically, us who are the saints are going to be receiving it because of what Christ said in Revelation chapter 3 to the Church of Philadelphia. But let's talk about let's talk about this serious problem that we see kind of encapsulated in the nutshell of what has been come to um, be known as Pizzagate, which is really a microcosm of a huge problem, the extent to which we don't even know. I thought I thought I had a pretty good grasp on it, maybe more than a lot of people did, because of what I understood about the Franklin scandal, the Franklin cover-up, what happened in Franklin and Omaha and Lincoln. And after finding out that John DeCamp himself, along with Ted Gunderson and the other power players all involved in what was going on over there, I realized that, again, we can't begin to know the scope of what's going on. I think we can begin to understand the evil of it if we read between the lines, understanding that John DeCamp wrote that book as an agent and as a gatekeeper. And there's many agents and gatekeepers out there that we can extract good information from. But their overall narrative, we're going to have to discard. We're going to have to do that with John DeCamp. But there's a lot that we can understand from what he has to say in that book. And also what little bits that uh, Gunderson reveals concerning his actions when it comes to the Nebraska case. I think also if you'll take the time to watch things like boys for sale and it is hard to watch i'm going to warn you it's hard some of the things that they reveal that are done to children are going to be terrifically difficult to digest i promise you that before you go in and there was that uh documentary made about hollywood an open secret you find out things from that too but in general none of these things none of these things are getting down to the bottom of why is it cuz i know a lot of people are asking this question when they start looking into these things they see what's going on and yeah it is prolific amongst catholic priests it's prolific they have covered up so much in their ranks. It is just beyond comprehension. Kevin Annette. I don't, I don't know concerning Kevin Annette. I, I don't know. I don't know if he's a gatekeeper or for real or not. I don't. I'm sorry. I don't know who does. But that's the thing. Oftentimes we can't know. We're, we're going to have to go into this. As far as vetting people and their information cautiously prayerfully extract what meat we can leave what bones we can but Kevin Annette 
uh, if you take the uh, all of the material that he has out there, you'll get a very good picture of what the Catholic Church has to do with this worldwide epidemic of child molestation. Now, back to us thinking or, and wondering, what, why, why, why in the world is it that a person could be arrested for possessing uh, some Schedule A or Schedule B prescription pills and get the same sentence or sometimes a worse sentence than somebody who has it, that that it has been proven that they anally penetrated a child and that's for real you can look up what the typical sentences are for downright absolutely 100% black and white convicted child molesters and see what little slaps on the hand these people that that do these vile things get so it's it's going to be a question in a lot of people's minds why why are they getting such light sentences why is so much of it being covered up and moreover why does it seem like so many of these people who have a propensity towards molesting children why do they keep being put right back into positions where they can do more harm well <clears throat> I've got an idea about that It's based on a lot of what I've heard or read and basically understand about secret programs that are at least similar to MKUltra, Monarch, anything that has to do with mind control because the one thing that we can understand about mind control based on the testimonies of everyone who has come out and said that they were a part of these yes government and military sponsored mind control projects what they do they either themselves abuse these children and they prefer younger children probably b below the age of 10 and they sadistically abuse them normally sexually because of how um, of how much trauma it causes in children to be sexually abused but they'll do more than that uh, oftentimes it's just very sadistic abuse but I think that they have found that it is the sexual component of abuse in children that creates an environment in the psyche of these people to where they are the most suggestible now if you think about it um, based on for instance Paul Bonacci's um, deposition and his testimony concerning what they do uh, and I'm going to mention Kathy O'Brien, and I know, I already know, any of you who's looked closely at Kathy O'Brien, you understand that she does nothing, says nothing, without Mark Phillips around her handler. I know that there's a lot of people who, who believe that, and it doesn't, I know it doesn't look good either with him and her. And so it's hard to tell. how much of what she's saying is meant to help inform us and what is actually help helping to to disinform us but you also have um, Sue Ford who wrote under the name Bryce Taylor 
and other children, young adults who had gone through this either officially um, at the hands of people like Michael Aquino um, or unofficially. And they will tell you again and again a consistent story that it was specifically the kind of abuse that they went through that made them very malleable in their psyche so that somebody who was an apt programmer could create what they call alters in their psyche. These alters, when I suppose it's done properly to a child, and I hate even using that word, they can make a a person form completely distinct individual personalities that don't remember what the other personality is doing that will act entirely independently of other personalities will do things that they have trained them to do under those different personalities because they have found that that trauma that they experience at those young ages and most specifically, and it would certainly seem that the worst trauma that children can go through at those young ages is molestation, being molested, sexually hurt, and violated like that. I think, I think that there's other information that they found along the way, like in general. Maybe what they found was that in general, all children who experience molestation of one sort or the other are far more docile and suggestible than children who have not gone through extreme traumas like that. I'm actually beginning to believe that the reason that there are such light penalties for sexual offenders in general, and the reason that not only do specifically the Roman Catholic Church in the Vatican, specifically them, cover up all of the molestations of their priests, and it's a lot. I think that they knowingly put offenders and those likely to offend in the positions where they are most likely to violate the most children. And I think they do that with every kind of disgusting pedophile offender they can. They put them in positions where they can do the most offense to the most people. Because it seems to me that that's the only way you can explain why not only are they not prosecuted heavily like they should be, they don't come to justice, but why they are so often repeatedly put into positions where they can continue to hurt children. They're more docile, they're more suggestible, and so in general, the more the more people that become adults who, when they were children, were violated or molested and went through that trauma, I think as far as they're concerned, they think that that's better because I believe that they think, they've probably, not think, they probably found out, I'm sure these are the factors and components that are even being kept from us by those gatekeepers who are just going to give us what bit of, you know, a small amount of information that, that they have to, to, to keep us from stop. We, we, when somebody like Kathy O'Brien comes out with a book like The Transformation of America, the information that she's giving there not only contains a certain amount of truth, but of course, like with John DeCamp and people like him, gatekeepers, what they do is their works that they're doing, it, they're meant to keep us from asking further questions, from going deeper. You know, mostly who she talks about in Transformation of America are people like, you know, prominent politicians. But she doesn't get into, of course, who their loyalties are to. You know, the loyalty of Skull and Bones. 
that its loyalty is to the papacy. It, it doesn't go beyond that. And the other thing that I believe that books by her and maybe others who are specific gatekeepers are meant to do is to keep us from asking those questions and getting to the answers like, why are so many top offenders against children? Why do they keep putting them into situations where they can keep offending? Those are the questions that we have to answer. And this is part of my worldview, is that I'm starting to believe that the reason that they do this is for mass mind control. That's what they're trying to do, is get populations of people, and most specifically in the United States of America, because we represent the population out of all the countries in the world that could show them the greatest amount of resistance to what they're doing. So, of course, they're targeting not only our population, but the population of other countries that could potentially show them the greatest amount of resistance and problems. Countries like Australia, the UK, South Africa, and, and, and European countries. But more than them, the population, the citizenry of the United States, I believe, is targeted with this stuff above and beyond all of them. It is for the sake of controlling populations. There are many things that they can do to control populations in the way we think. But what I'm doing right now as part of this series of talking about worldviews is I'm trying to suggest that that's the reason. That's the reason why they're not prosecuting the uh, the the child molesters harder and the offenders of children harder. It's because there's information that none of those gatekeepers are telling us about, or that maybe they didn't even tell some of those victims themselves. Because why should they tell them? Why should they need to know that it is in fact that brutal act towards that young, tender, impressionable mind that makes them so easy then to control. So the greater and greater and greater amounts of the population that you get who have been damaged in that way, it just assures that the greater segment of the population that will be more easy to mind control. So that's, uh, that's something that I hope all of you who have taken an interest in this subject with, you know, everybody in their, <clears throat> excuse me, everybody and their brother out there who are interested in getting more clicks on their YouTube channel so that they can make more uh, advertising money. And uh, those with Patreon accounts like David Siemens, who wants to get people with big hearts to give him more and more money, they, of course, keep, uh, keep, talking about Pizzagate, well, that's so utterly superficial, but it, it leads to things far deeper that we need to be brave enough to confront and brave enough to look at. We need to be brave enough to dig into and find out what are the nefarious underlying reasons for all of these things they're doing and all the information that they're keeping from us. So I do hope that uh, this first video today uh, concerning worldviews and sculpting, forming our worldviews and, and how I think that we're going to have to do that, I hope that it has benefited you and edified you and I really do hope that it will cause you to think about these things. Um, so that my ultimate goal, so that many of you will find yourselves in a position where you are very well equipped to help and teach me, because that's the other characteristic that the Philadelphian church is going to have. It's made up of two words, um, phila and delphi, phileo being the Greek form of brotherly love, a man's uh, love for his fellow man or woman or child. Uh, this doesn't mean just men. It means uh, the, the love of the human being for the human being, that kind of love, that sort of real love. Like Jesus said, 
No greater love has a man than he should lay down his life for his friends. That's the kind of characteristic that we're going to have to have in this Philadelphian church. Delphi meaning city, the city of brotherly love. That's why I called Philadelphia, Pennsylvania that, which completely, um, I think, mocks that the name of that city. But these are the characteristics that we're going to have to have. This is why I have entitled all that I do and labor as I do under the um, the banner of truth that is Proverbs 23, 23. Buy the truth and do not sell it. So this is just... Uh, well, just scraping the iceberg today. And I hope that as I go on with these discussions concerning forming our worldview and how we have to, that it will, it will help us all. And so I want to thank all of you for listening today. And before I let you go, I want to remind you that uh, Jesus is Lord. And it's God's kingdom that's forever. And I'm your servant. Farewell.